you are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. On the 16th of January 2000, a nurse was on her way to the Mission St. Joseph's Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina, where she was about to start her shift. As she came up to the hospital, something caught her eye. In the parking lot of Little Pig's Barbecue Restaurant on McDowell Street was a car with its headlights on, but no passengers inside. As she went closer to the blue Mazda Protege, she realized that the car belonged to a former classmate of hers, 18-year-old Zeb Quinn. She rushed to the hospital where Zeb's mom, Denise, worked as a neonatal nurse. Zeb had been missing for two weeks, and finding the car could have led his family and investigators to him. Denise left the hospital and raced to Little Pigs to find a strange scene. Yes, she confirmed. The car belonged to her son, Zeb. But something was wrong. The headlights were switched on, and the windows were cracked. On the back window was a pair of lips and two exclamation marks drawn with pink lipstick. Denise called police and investigators were there in no time. Inside the car, they found a Labrador mixed puppy. Denise had never seen the dog before and had no idea where it came from. A quick look revealed that the driver's seat was moved very close to the steering wheel, too close for the five foot nine Zeb to have been the driver. They also found some empty bottles, a plastic hotel key card, and a jacket. When his car was found, Zeb had already been missing for two weeks. On the 2nd of January 2000, Zeb Quinn told his mother that he was going out after his shift at Walmart. He wanted to look at a second-hand vehicle that he was interested in buying. After Zeb left work that Sunday night, no one ever saw him again. The car was the first vital clue in the mystery. But even though it looked like a treasure trove of evidence, it did not bring investigators any closer in finding Zeb Quinn. The plastic hotel key card could not be linked to any hotel. There were hairs on the jacket that did not belong to Zeb. But without a suspect to match it to, it was useless. Inside were no fingerprints or any other traceable evidence. After checking with all local breeders, animal shelters, and pet stores, investigators were also not able to determine where the Labrador puppy had come from. They were back to square one in a puzzling investigation that would span across two decades. Zeb Wayne Quinn was born on the 12th of May, 1981, in North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountain town, Asheville. He was one of two children of Denise Vlakis and enjoyed spending time with his sister, Brandy. Zeb was smaller than the other kids, and he never really fit in or had a best friend. He had an organizational learning disorder and was known to be somewhat naive. He went to T.C. Robertson High School, and whenever he had the chance, he went fishing. It gave him peace, somewhere he could be himself outside of the pressures of high school cliques and dramas. He was a quiet guy who kept out of trouble. His mother never worried that he was running around with a bad crowd, as he was centered and reliable. When Zeb joined the high school's Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps, or ROTC, he finally found something that he loved to be a part of. He learned time management, military customs, and courtesies, and was encouraged to hone in on leadership skills. He loved the community projects and the physical activity that comes with joining the ROTC. After high school, he enrolled at Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College. He also took a job at Walmart on Hendersonville Road, working in the electronics department. He enjoyed his job, and customers loved him. Even when he was off the clock, he would hang out there and chat with friends and regular patrons. 
He was so honest, he wouldn't even let his mom use his discount card. That was Zeb. A straight down the line, nice guy, through and through. Yet in the time leading up to Y2K, Zeb told a friend at work that he had met a girl and fallen in love. Zeb met Misty Taylor at a Christmas party. Her blonde curls and warm smile immediately caught his attention. The two became friends, but before long, Zeb became infatuated and acted like he had never acted before. He would gush to his family and co-workers about their long phone conversations. But things were complicated on Misty's end. She confessed to Zeb that she had a boyfriend and a child. And she was scared to leave her boyfriend because he was abusive to her. Zeb's family and friends warned him about Misty and her complicated life, and suggested he stayed away from her. Zeb was an uncomplicated, straightforward person, and he did not need any drama in his life. Zeb listened to what they had to say, but he was so drawn to Misty, he simply couldn't stay away from her. One day, Zeb showed up at Misty's house unannounced and was surprised to find her boyfriend, Wesley Smith, there as well. He never told anyone exactly what happened, but he did admit to friends at Walmart that he was scared of Wesley. For New Year's Eve, both Zeb and Misty turned down invitations to parties and stayed home instead. They engaged in a long, flirtatious phone call, despite Zeb's concerns about Misty's boyfriend. For two days following New Year's Eve, Zeb did not hear from Misty and became worried. He called her, but forgot to follow his usual habit of dialing star 67 to hide his caller identity. They agreed that he would do this in case her boyfriend was there. But the one time he forgot to do it, Wesley picked up Misty's phone. Zeb's grandmother witnessed the call as a wide-eyed Zeb hung up and said, I'm in trouble now. I'm in big trouble now. But Zeb did not have much time to dwell on it as his shift at Walmart was about to begin. They were just coming out of the busy holiday period and everyone worked longer shifts. When his mom finished up her shift at the hospital, she paged Zeb and asked if he wanted to join her and her boyfriend for a late dinner, but he didn't reply. She wasn't alarmed because she knew how busy Walmart could get at that time of year. When she arrived home, she sent him another page, saying that she was home in case he went to the restaurant looking for her. Still, he didn't reply. It was around 9 p.m. when Zeb finished his shift in the electronics department, and he had plans to go and look at a second-hand Mitsubishi Eclipse that he wanted to buy. A friend from work, Jason Owens, offered to go with him. They met while working together at Walmart and occasionally played pool together. After they clocked out at work that Sunday night, they left the parking lot with Zeb driving his light blue Mazda Protégé and Jason following in his Ford pickup truck. At 9.14 p.m., Zeb pulled into the Eblin Sitgo service station on Hendersonville Road. Zeb and Jason were seen on CCTV footage purchasing soft drinks in the store. First, Jason went in, followed by Zeb. They purchased their drinks separately and left individually. On the CCTV footage, the headlights are visible, and police could confirm the direction in which they left. Just over an hour later, at 10.30 p.m., Denise called Walmart and asked to speak to Zeb. She was told that he had clocked out at 9 p.m. Denise was confused. It was unlike Zeb not to be in touch if his plans had changed. She waited up, paging him every hour or two, with no reply. The night passed, and Zeb never came home. This had never happened before. Zeb and his mom had an honest and open relationship. He didn't need permission from her to go out, nor did he have a curfew. That wasn't necessary, because Zeb always told her where he was going, and he always came home. Denise, and Zeb's sister Brandy, looked in his room to see if he had packed any belongings. But everything was still there. His clothes, his toothbrush some cash, and his contact lens solution. They decided to give it until lunchtime. But when that came and went with no sign of Zeb, Denise decided it was time to go to the police. At 3 p.m. on the afternoon of January 3rd, 2000, Denise filed a missing persons report at her local police station. The next day, that is, two days after Zeb was last seen, his manager at the electronics department in Walmart, Patty King, received a call from someone claiming to be Zeb. But it didn't sound like Zeb. 
Patty had been his manager for two years. She knew him well, and the voice on the other end of the line was definitely not him. Patty was immediately alarmed, because she knew Denise was looking for Zeb. She kept the person on the line as long as she could. The person claiming to be Zeb said that he was sick and that he would not make it into work. Patty asked him straight, Who is this? The person replied, This is Zeb Quinn. I will not be into work today. Patty tried to keep the person on the line and pretended to be confused, saying that he had come through to the wrong department. She asked him where he was scheduled to work that day, and the person was not able to answer. After the conversation, Patty was able to dial star 69, a method that was used to call back the number of the party who had just called you. The call went through to a local Volvo construction equipment company, and Patty knew Zeb was in trouble. She immediately called Denise and told her about the bizarre phone call, and Denise reported it to police. At this point, Zeb's co-workers joined the dots and told police about Jason Owens. Owens worked as a nighttime stock person at Walmart, and he also had a part-time job at Volvo. When law enforcement confronted Owens, he admitted he made the call because Zeb had called him and asked him to. He never asked Zeb why, but he didn't need an explanation. He didn't mind doing his buddy a favor. He assumed he was skipping out on work because he didn't feel like going. Police didn't buy it. There was also no evidence of Zeb ever calling Owens. They were able to establish that Owens left with Zeb on the night of his disappearance. According to Owens, after the two of them had stopped to buy a soft drink at the Sitco, they continued to drive to an address where Zeb was going to look at a car. He said somewhere before 9.30, as they were in the vicinity of T.C. Robertson High School, Zeb flashed his headlights, indicating Owen should pull over. Zeb jumped out of his car and told Owens that he had received a page and needed to make an urgent phone call. According to Owens, Zeb walked off to find a payphone, while Owens waited in his car. Ten minutes later, Zeb returned. His whole mood and demeanor had changed. He was frantic and told Owens that he had to leave immediately. He thanked him for his time, but said he wasn't going to look at the eclipse after all. Then, Zeb got back into his Mazda, and in a hurry to get going, he rear-ended Owens' truck. Zeb was completely flustered. He apologized and promised to pay for the damage. And before Owens could say anything, Zeb sped off. And that's the last time Owens ever saw Zeb Quinn. Police took Jason Owens' statement and then visited the Volvo plant where he worked part-time. His managers told police that on Monday morning, the 3rd of January, Owens was late for work. He told his manager that he had been in a motor vehicle accident near the Waffle House on Long Shoals Road in the early hours of the morning. This was not the incident with Zeb, but a second accident. Owens was treated for a head injury and a cracked rib, but still managed to make it to work. Police followed up with medical staff at the ER, and they said they were not convinced that Owens' injuries were caused by a car accident. Owens drove himself to hospital and left by himself when he was discharged. Police felt uncomfortable about Jason Owens. They found a story about having two car accidents in less than 12 hours implausible. Also, he did not mention the second accident to police when they first interviewed him about Zeb's whereabouts. Police looked at Owens' pickup truck and it did not have more than a couple of dents. It did not look like it had been in two accidents, one of which was so bad he injured his head and broke some ribs. They also followed up with all patrol cars and could not find any reports of an accident along Long Shoals Road or anywhere near it on the night of the 2nd to the 3rd of January. Things did not look good for Owens, but he stood by his statement, and although police were not convinced, they still did not know what had happened to Zeb. Investigators managed to track down Zeb's secret love interest, Misty Taylor. They interviewed her at her grandmother's house, where she was living with her daughter. Misty claimed that there was nothing between her and Zeb. He was a new friend, more of an acquaintance, and she had no idea what could have happened to him. Police wondered why Misty would downplay her relationship with Zeb. According to Zeb's family and friends, there was most certainly something brewing between the two of them. So much so that it caused friction between Zeb and his mother, who usually had a great relationship. Denise felt 
that after becoming involved with Misty, Zeb's behavior had changed, like he had lost focus or something. Denise told police that Zeb once took the family Jeep without permission to take Misty, her child, and a child she was babysitting to the mall. He also ignored two of his mother's pages before responding to a third message. Investigators asked Misty about the extended phone call on New Year's Eve and the fact that she did not speak to Zeb after that. They told her the story that Zeb's grandmother told them about him forgetting to dial star 67 and then being shaken up when he spoke to Wesley. Misty downplayed the whole thing and maintained that Wesley knew there was nothing between her and Zeb. After speaking to Misty, police went to speak to Wesley Smith at a house where he was doing a painting job. He also denied knowing what had happened to Zeb. Although investigators felt that Misty and Wesley were both downplaying the importance of Zeb in Misty's life, they thought it could perhaps be due to the fact that their relationship was a secret and because Wesley had a tendency to be violent towards Misty. It was perhaps understandable that she was cautious to come out with the whole truth. Besides, the last person to have seen Zeb, Jason Owens, had a lot to answer for. Police ran a background check on him and found that his only run-in with the law was a DUI the previous year. He was born in nearby Leicester to Betsy Linda Owens, and no father was cited on his birth certificate. He went to Irwin High School and did odd jobs until he started working at Volvo and Walmart. Police set out to corroborate Owens' version of events on the night of Zeb's disappearance. They confirmed that Zeb did, in fact, receive a page around 9.30. It came from Zeb's father's sister, Ina Ustich. Before his disappearance, Zeb had very little contact with his aunt or any of his dad's family after his parents split up. His aunt said that she never sent that page. But later on, she informed that she thought her home was broken into during the time the page was sent. Nothing was stolen but some things like photo frames were moved around. At the time the page was sent, Zeb's aunt was at a friend's house for dinner. This friend was named Tamara Taylor, Misty's mother. Misty and her boyfriend Wesley and their child were also at the dinner. Ina and Tamara Taylor were good friends, and they saw each other often because they were opening a restaurant together. Police found Ina's story strange. The break-in with nothing stolen and the call made to Zeb's pager on that very night simply didn't add up. Was she hiding something? Did Misty perhaps sneak out of the dinner to go to Ina's house, where she would be alone, so she could page Zeb? Police felt that the only person in Zeb's life that would have enough emotional effect on Zeb to have reacted the way Owen said he did was Misty. But even so, police were taking Owen's statement with a grain of salt. Two weeks after Zeb's disappearance, there was still no sign of him. That is, until his car showed up at the bizarre scene in the Little Pig's barbecue parking lot. The location was significant because Zeb's mom, grandmother, and sister all worked as neonatal nurses at the hospital right around the corner. His mother was convinced the car was parked there on purpose to make sure that they found it. The implication is that the person who left the car there knew Zeb well enough to know where they worked. The puppy was only three months old, and she was adopted by one of the officers who came to the scene. The clues from the car brought more questions than answers. The lips drawn on the back window with pink lipstick suggested a love or sexual link. The position of the driver's seat suggested that a person significantly shorter than Zeb drove the car to where it was left. Could it have been Misty? A couple of days after the car was discovered, witnesses came forward and said that they saw the blue Mazda in downtown Asheville and that they were able to provide a description of the female driver. When the composite sketch was done, police were shocked to see the strong resemblance of the driver to Misty Taylor. However, there was no evidence in the car to place Misty or Wesley inside. Police believed there was more than one person involved in Zeb's disappearance and tried to establish a connection between Jason Owens, Misty Taylor, and Wesley Smith. But no matter how hard they tried, they simply could not find anything linking them, other than the fact that they all knew Zeb. A month after Zeb vanished, police obtained a warrant to take hair, blood, and saliva samples from Jason Owens. Zeb's mom, Denise, knew from early on in the investigation 
that Zeb had met with foul play. She believed firmly that if he had left on his own accord, he would have been in contact with his family. She spoke in an interview saying, We all feel very certain that he was killed that night. With no new leads or information, Zeb's case went cold. His mother and sister never stopped looking for him, and if anything of interest came onto their radar, they immediately contacted police. In 2002, Owens caught police attention again. He refused to stop at a routine police checkpoint and sped off. Police set off after him, and he started shooting at the police car. In the end, he drove into a mailbox and his truck flipped. Owens was charged with reckless driving and assault on a police officer, facing four years in prison. Five years after Zeb's disappearance, there was still no answer. In 2005, police did a reenactment of Zeb's last known movements on the night of his disappearance, hoping it would reignite some interest in the case and perhaps urge witnesses to come forward. But again, nothing of significance came up, and they had to go back to the drawing board. Asheville police never lost sight of Jason Owens, and in April 2007, they had enough evidence to secure a search warrant on Owens' property in Leicester. Although he had been on police radar for many years, it was only after seven years that they officially named him as a person of interest in Zeb Quinn's case, a case that had been changed from a missing persons case to a homicide. Police used ground-piercing radar to search the property for human remains. They partnered with scientists from NecroSearch, a nonprofit organization that specializes in finding hidden graves. But the search did not yield enough evidence to charge Owens with anything. In 2009, police collected hair, saliva, and fingerprint evidence from Misty Taylor to send for further testing, but stated she was not a suspect. Zeb's disappearance featured on Discovery Channel's Disappeared in 2012, and the case became rather well-known in the true crime community. It was not until 2015, when a married couple from Leicester disappeared, that police were able to reignite Zeb's case. 38-year-old Christy Schoen and her 44-year-old husband, J.T. Codd, had recently moved to North Carolina after falling in love with the mountains. Christy was pregnant with a baby girl they were going to name Skylar, and they felt that the mountains would be a perfect place to raise a family. It was a big change for the couple who came from Los Angeles, where both worked in the TV and film industry. J.T. was a grip, and Christy, a caterer who had tried her luck in front of the cameras on season 8 of Food Network Star, a stint that tweaked her career from someone cooking for film stars into becoming somewhat of a celebrity herself. Although the future looked bright in California, both Christy and JT yearned for a slower pace once their kids were born. They had spent some time in Leicester and knew that was where they belonged. Christy dreamt of opening a farm-to-table cafe in Leicester with locally sourced produce. JT was excited about a new project of flipping houses with a friend, George Lycan. On Tuesday, the 10th of March, JT made plans to meet his friend George for beers the following afternoon. Via text message, they arranged to meet at 5 p.m. at the Pizza and Brew in Asheville. But JT was a no-show. George sent a text around 5.15, but JT never replied. George found it strange that JT never got in touch to say why he stood him up and sent him a text on Thursday asking if they were okay. The reply came at 12.15 p.m. and was sent from Christie's phone, not JT's. It read, Sorry, we both have this stomach flu, throwing up and such. We both have just been trying to sleep it off. George was suspicious. It didn't sound like Christie. And why did JT not reply? He wasn't quite sure what to make of the text. Meanwhile, Christie and JT's family also grew concerned when they were not able to reach either of them. When they failed to show up in Mississippi on the set of a grip gig JT was booked for, it was obvious something wasn't quite right. Christie's dad, Bill Schoen, reported them missing on Saturday, the 14th of March. Police visited their home on Hooker's Gap Road to conduct a welfare check. Both JT and Christie's cars were in the drive, but there was no sign of the couple. Their house was ransacked, and it looked like they had been burglarized. Their two dogs were also inside the house, unattended. Christie's purse and JT's wallet was found inside the home, which made police wonder if the burglary was staged. 
Later on the Sunday evening, police received a report of a suspicious person putting items in a dumpster on Donna Drive in Candler. The dumpster was situated in a residential area in between homes. The items belonged to the Cods. Among it was the ID of Christy Schoen Cod. The witness was able to provide a clear description of the man who dumped the items. And police were familiar with the man. It sounded a whole lot like their main suspect in Zeb Quinn's case, Jason Owens. 34-year-old Owens lived on Owens Cove Road, only a mile from the Cod's home. He lived on a 1.4-acre property in a double-wide trailer. They knew each other because Owens was doing construction work at the time and helped JT and George renovate properties for resale. Although Owens owned his own construction business, he wasn't doing too well, making only about $300 a month. Perhaps a good motive to commit a burglary? Police went straight to Owens' home to interview him at 1.30 on Monday morning, March 16th. At first, he denied having any knowledge about their disappearance. He said that he had stolen from them and dumped some of the items that had no monetary value. Police didn't buy it and pushed him for the truth. Eventually, Owens buckled under the pressure and revealed the horrific truth of what happened to JT and Christy. He told police that JT's 2008 Dodge Ram had become stuck at a nearby creek, and he offered to help. Owens wasn't supposed to drive due to a previous conviction, but as they were not on a public road, he thought it should be okay. Owens got into the driver's seat, while JT and Christy stood in front of the car to push it backwards. Owens thought he had shifted the gear into reverse, But when he stepped on the accelerator, the car leapt forward, driving over both JT and Christy. JT was unresponsive, but Christy appeared to be all right. According to Owens, he carried her into the house to try and help her, but she passed away on the living room floor. When he went back to the truck, JT was no longer alive. Owens panicked. He felt it was a horrible accident. But what scared him more was the fact that he was not supposed to be driving. And if he had to report the incident, he would have had to gone back to jail. He then took both their bodies to his trailer where he kept them until he decided how to dispose of their remains. On Thursday, the 11th of March, he dismembered both JT and Christie's bodies and burnt the body parts in a wood stove. Police arrested Owens on the spot and searched his property the next night. They found bone fragments in the wood stove. They also confiscated a saw blade, 11 knives, a tow strap, an extension cord, as well as debris from the yard. Police were able to confirm that the last time JT's cell phone was used was on Wednesday the 11th of March. Texts were sent from Christie's cell phone to George Lichen on the 12th and to Christie's mom on the 14th two days after police believed she was killed. George Lichen was shocked when he heard what had happened. He knew Owens and said that he was a good worker who never caused any trouble. George believed that it was Owens who replied to his text on Thursday the 12th of March, not Christy. Christy worked on the set of The Terminator and was loved by everyone who knew her. After her death, Arnold Schwarzenegger tweeted, Speechless, Christy wasn't just a part of The Terminator crew, She brought us together at meals like a family. Thoughts are with her loved ones. Knowing that Owens was capable of murder and disposing of human remains, the question had to be asked. Did he murder Zeb Quinn? And if so, what did he do with his remains? Zeb's mom, Denise Vlakis, spoke at a press conference. She said, Like everyone else in the community, our family is horrified by what has happened. The fact that Jason Owens has been charged with their murders surprises us, and yet it doesn't. Jason was, and still is, a person of interest in the disappearance of my son, Zeb Quinn, on January 2nd, 2000. We want to remind everyone that Jason's arrest has nothing to do with Zeb's case, and that as of now, there is no new information concerning Zeb that we are aware of. We would like to ask the public to please not overshadow this couple's heartbreaking investigation with statements posts, and questions about Zeb. We acknowledge and appreciate the abundant support we have always received from our friends and community, and trust you will all give the Cod Schoen families the same gift. The search for any possible evidence of Zeb went up in flames before it even started. 
Five days after Owens' arrest in connection with the deaths of Christie and J.T. Cod, a fire was reported at his property on Owens Cove Road. The fire was ruled to be arson and started in a trailer about 50 yards away from the main residence, Owens' double-wide trailer. A week later, an unnamed relative of Owens came forward with chilling evidence. He told police that in January 2000, Owens dug a pit on his property to dispose of items by burning them. Sometime later, he poured concrete over the eight-square-foot pit. The relative thought it was strange and asked Owens about it. He said that he was making a fish pond, a project he never completed. After a while, Owens filled in the pit with dirt, and that was the end of it. The relative was able to take police to the spot where Owens had dug the pit and pointed out that it was an odd location for a fish pond. One would not have been able to see it from the trailer home, so why bother at all? Why make a fish pond on a random place of your vast property? At the end of March, police conducted another search of the property on Owens Cove Road. Cadaver dogs are brought in, and students from a criminal justice class at Western Carolina University assisted in fine combing the property. The search yielded several plastic bags containing an unknown white powder. Speculation was that it could have been pulverized lime or mortar mix. Unknown hard fragments, thought to be human bone, fabric, and a piece of leather were discovered under a layer of concrete. They were confident that if Owens had discarded of Zeb's body, they would be able to find it in the evidence collected that day. Two months later, an area of Bent Creek Experimental Forest was searched in relation with Zeb's case. Officials refused to discuss the tip that had led them there and wouldn't tell reporters if Owens had confessed to Zeb's murder or not. On the 27th of April, 2017, Robert Jason Owens stood trial for the murders of Christy Schoen Cod, J.T. Cod, and their unborn child. Zeb Quinn's family made sure to be there too, showing support to the Schoen and Cod families. Owens admitted to the murders and pled guilty to dismembering human remains. He said he disposed of the bodies because he feared the police. According to Owens, he suffered from PTSD from being named a suspect in Zeb Quinn's case. The jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to 59 and a half years in prison without the possibility of parole. Three months later, on the 10th of July, 2017, Owens was indicted with the first-degree murder of Zeb Quinn. Owens showed no emotion, but insisted that he was innocent. He said that he did not kill Zeb, but he knew who did. This was not discussed at the indictment hearing, but information surfaced about a letter that Owens had written to a neighbor in 2016. In the letter, he named his uncle as the killer. He said that he had been living in fear of his uncle after he saw what he did in January 2000. The uncle allegedly threatened Owens, so much so that Owens' brother took out a restraining order. He was not to come anywhere near Owens Cove Road. Said uncle was not able to shed any light on this accusation because he died in 2014. When Owens was first interviewed about the disappearance of Christine and JT, he confessed to their murders and told police everything that had happened. Yet for 20 years, he refuses to admit killing Zeb. Could it be that he was not the killer after all? Owens is still awaiting trial as prosecutors prepare the case against him. Nothing about this case is straightforward. So many questions remain, especially regarding the bizarre appearance of Zeb's car two weeks after he vanished. There are so many strange turns, like the page Zeb received from his Aunt Ina's house. And how about Misty Taylor and Wesley Smith? Did they know more than they said they did? Was there a link between them and Jason Owens, unknown to investigators? Time will tell. One can only hope that all is revealed at Owens' imminent trial. We will keep an eye on this case and keep you posted. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Evidence Locker Podcast to see more about today's case. If you like our podcast, please subscribe in iTunes or CastBox or wherever you get your podcasts. We would also appreciate it if you could review the episodes, as it gives us some street cred in the world of podcasting. And while you're waiting for our next episode, why not listen to one of our podcasting friends? Hey, this is Olivia. 
And I'm Tashana. We're the hosts of Something's Not Right. We do a bunch of research and then we tell each other crazy stories. They're usually about true crime, but we're down to talk about anything strange or disturbing. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, and you don't mind a little salty language, check us out. For more info on Something's Not Right, visit notrightpodcast.net. This was The Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.